Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the show. We are so glad to be here with you. We're excited that we got to come on on Saturday night. Saturdays has been tough for us just because we both got a lot in the hopper. But we're we're glad to be here with everybody. Uh, Watchful, how are you? Doing pretty good. Enjoyed a uh, nice, peaceful Sabbath with the family. Yeah, it, it was nice. Really, um, just, it, it, I almost have to force myself not to work, but it, it was, it was, it was very relaxing. It, it was, I enjoyed it. So tonight we're going to go into more of a story with Abraham. We talked about it the other night, but it's going to lead into the Sodom and Gomorrah story. And it's interesting how, it ties all in with really where society is today. You know, the Bible clearly states that in the end times, it will be like the days of Noah. And this story is structured around kind of the beginning. Abraham, his bloodline goes back maybe five, six, seven generations to Noah and Shem. So it's I'm excited to talk about it. But before we get into that... Wanted to let you guys know, if you haven't uh, sub to our other channel, Truth Burns, there's a link in the description. Uh, we'd appreciate everybody if you subscribe to it. We do our news segments there. And Monday, Dr. Sean, he's going to be talking about something he's an expert in, other than his Bible concepts and his, uh, his sermons and teachings. You know, he was in the agency for a long time. He worked in some of the most secret parts of the government doing threat assessment and the agency. He was in the Navy, helped with the Secret Service. Anyways, he's going to talk Monday about threat assessment, how to actually disable your enemy, uh, observing your environment that you're in so you can detect stuff that looks like that's abnormal. For example, whenever we go out to dinner or go out to eat, wherever we sit in the restaurant, my back is always positioned so I can see the front door. It's just something that he's kind of drilled into my head over the years. And I think it will be helpful for everybody that's watching what he's going to talk about. It, you, you never know. It could, it could save your life. Yeah. What news did you run across today, brother? Well, I'm really curious uh, on what you did. You find any? I didn't do a whole lot of work over the Sabbath, but I know that uh, we left it with the bombardment in what is it, Syria, Iran, and Iraq? Yeah, uh, 85 different targets. I mean, it, it, and they gave them plenty of warning to vacate. So, what the heck's going up with that? From what I've been told by family members that are involved. The targets aren't wasted targets. They had been mm. strategically looking at stuff for quite some time. <clears throat> there was supply lines, weapons caches, uh, a lot of stuff. Yeah. And they're still hitting them now. And what's even more yeah. interesting is they're using bombers that are long-distance bombers. So they're not using what they have locally, meaning... A good bit of these are not taking off from aircraft carriers. They're using actual like B-21 bombers that are coming in and air refueling. So mm -hmm. they're keeping the powder dry on a lot of their local assets, which is interesting. You know, that you can tell a lot by what's going on in a region based off of what's in the air, what assets they're using. So it's right. You're right. It is interesting. Do you have any Some, idea on why, what the trigger is, and what's what the objective is? No, I don't. You know, it's our yeah. our leadership is, in my opinion, somewhat questionable. You would have thought yeah. that right after there was, um, you know, deaths, you know, it would have been a return return strike almost immediately, like you said, to not allow the leadership on the opposing team to get underground and scatter. That's yeah, right. They gave them several days to yeah. prepare. But in their defense, you know, there was no air assets of ours that were shot down. Right. The were able to go in and pretty much have complete air supremacy. Their yeah. uh ground controlled defense system, they they really 
they're just sitting there. So regardless if we did not take out any of their leadership, they had been scrutinizing tons of stuff, supply lines, weapons caches. They have a plan. They're just not making it clear, though. I'm with you. Um, why would they wait so long to respond? So that's yeah. a question of mine. Yeah, if it, if it was a retaliatory strike, you would have think you would think that it would have been much closer to to an event. This was just so out of the random. It was like in the middle of the fight with Texas. One would think that this is a distraction from Texas. Yeah, it's um, it's hard to try to understand their reasoning for a lot of things they do. I'm going to cut to my screen real quick and show something that I think you'll find interesting. It's regarding e Elon Musk. Oh, okay. Yeah. So let me go here. So Elon made a post. The only action needed to save the climate change is mm. a carbon tax. Right. A carbon tax. And I've seen several people comment, including Ben. This is the first time I've seen him make a post that makes you really question what side is he on? I, I've yeah. never seen him talk about this. It, it really, you know, it, I, I asked, I asked myself, did he get hacked? So <laughs> it's just, yeah, he taxes are something that he's intimately familiar with. This is probably a, um, I think this is a, a trolling post because of the the World Economic F uh, uh, Forum and what they're proposing as far as uh, reducing the carbon and we are the carbon that they want to reduce. Right. I, I think this is his response to the only thing that, that you know, it would be a good suggestion is a carbon tax. Hmm. What, what I'm interested in is, is there any way we can get somebody to talk to him and ask him his opinion about this world flip? you know, the rotation of the earth, because climate change is the least of our concerns in regards to the ozone being, you know, eaten away, because it sounds to me like it is well known that the, that the, mag that the magnetic shield of the earth is be de being deteriorated and it's about to flip. You know, hmm. is he aware of that? Has he done any science? Does he, has he done any research into that? So is he just trolling when he's making these comments about, you know, the only good idea would be a carbon tax? Because, I mean, he is a big proponent, big proponent for saving the planet, you know, not like other people, though. You know, he's it's it, it, I've heard him talk many times and he said that we need more people. We need to encourage birth rates to go up because, you know, he's made the comment when you compare. Uh, births are when you compare diaper sales, I think is what he says <laughs> is, you know, diapers from newborns and diapers from old, from older generations. Uh, he says that you can see a, a, um, a decline of an, uh, the, the population is going down and that's bad for society. We, we have the luxuries that we have in the world today because the population has gotten to the point that we can actually, produce food in, in, you know, abundance and produce, uh, you know, consumer goods in abundance, produce textiles in abundance. And as the population goes down, those things start going away. And mm. he's, he's, you know, he's well aware that the population is in decline and it's detrimental for the planet. There is plenty of space, plenty of resources on this planet to sustain a, you know, a 10 X increase in, people on the planet and he's well aware of that and he's a uh, very outspoken when it comes to that yeah we've talked about that a few times that and on the screen i actually scrolled down a little so you guys could see ben's comment to him <laughs> ben responded you are so much smarter than this which leads to the inevitable conclusion that you are part of the plan say it mm. ain't so i wonder if he uh answered ben that'd be interesting so the next news article, which I'm going to switch screens and show, is New York City is gearing up to launch $53 million program for the illegal immigrants. They will receive a prepaid mm -hmm. credit card. So meanwhile, Mayor Eric Adams is wondering why the migrants keep coming to New York City. There's your question. 
the the programs make the illegals yeah. promise that they will only use the car uh, the card for food and baby supplies and stuff uh, essentials to support your family. The city is reportedly mm. making them sign an affidavit for this. So a family of four will receive up to a thousand dollars a month, and it will get replenished every twenty eight days. I want a thousand dollars a month. Mm. That'd I mean, be great. <laughs> Yeah, free free thousand bucks for incidentals. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, this is ridiculous. You know, why can't we do that for the people who are already in our country who are legal, many of which have defended our country? You know how many veterans there are that are homeless on the streets? You know, what about those people who are suffering from depression and mental illness? Why aren't we taking care of them? I mean, there's so much better use that they could that they could do with that money rather than facilitating these these criminal aliens that have come into the country illegally. I'm all for immigration, but do it legally. I'm all for helping immigrants who come in legally. But to go out of their way to facilitate this amount of money for criminal aliens is ridiculous. I mean, it's it's, it's highlights highlights their agenda. And it's just it's evil because they're, they're they're completely ignoring the people they should be taking care of. Hmm. It's, you know, like you said, it, folks that want to come to our country, I think that everybody should be welcome, but there's a process. Yeah. There's a, a legal process. I, I, I understand that in other parts of the world, there's really horrible situations going on and a family should be able to come here, though not through the process of cutting barbed wire and sneaking past Border Patrol. Though the yeah. the majority of what we're seeing is is not uh, families looking to get away from areas that are dangerous for their children, and we we don't have yeah. to rehash this. This, but we the large majority we're of those who are showing up are or you know military age males, and now they want to provide them housing and living expenses on that we're going to pay for it, yeah. it. It is somewhat frustrating just because the average American, just like you and I, you know, things are tight. It's, it's yeah. tough making ends meet each month. And I think that says that, you know, that's for just about everybody. I understand there's folks that are outside of the norm that have done well with their businesses and flourished, but I would guess the average American, things have been tight, especially if you have children. You know, food costs have gone up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Food so. cost is through the roof. Yeah. And food's actually getting scarcer. I was watching videos today of France where the grocery stores were completely empty. And I noticed the same thing in ours. Not even not even just the grocery stores. I went into Best Buy the other day in order to look for another camera because my uh, the little GoPro I was using kept shutting down on me. And they they have probably at least half of what they used to for consumer goods. I mean, it was I was amazed at how empty the shelves were. Like for for the webcams and for the cameras, they had you know one or two that were on the shelf. And you know that that was true for everything. It's just like the stores are getting barren. And you know, uh, we went into we went into another popular grocery store over here, uh, and just aisle after aisle was you know a quarter of what usually is in there. So you can see that something's definitely happening. You can see that not only are food prices going up, food is becoming more and more scarce. Yeah, they well, you know. Again, we've talked about this, but it's true. And I'm seeing a reflection in it as well. Um, I do a good bit of the shopping for the kids. And some of the stuff has been empty on the shelves. When I go to Walmart, if I go to Kroger and whatnot, it is yeah, it is somewhat concerning, though. I, I try to just, you know, push on through it, not think about it yeah. too much. So... Do you have any other news? Because I'm going to move on to our topic unless you have anything nope. else you want to talk about. Yeah, I didn't, didn't really spend a whole lot of time on the news this weekend. Yeah. Yep. Ne- neither did me. The, the news that I shared came from the volunteers providing us information, which is 
I want to say thank you to everybody that's been helping us. Anthony, Stephanie, yeah. uh, Kip. There's and there's more. I get we get a lot of emails, and I'm horrible with names. So if I didn't say you by name, uh, it doesn't mean I don't appreciate the emails that you've been sending. We've received a, a lot of encouraging emails. And folks, mm -hmm. volunteering information that has been really helpful. And yeah. I apologize in advance if I haven't responded to everybody's emails. We're, we're a tad overwhelmed. <laughs> so we're trying to keep up with we're it. We're growing. Yeah, we're growing. Growing pains. Yeah, for sure. So tonight, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. And the reason I want to talk about this is it seems like History is repeating itself, like in the days of Noah. And the correlation yeah. is interesting, especially as we approach the April 8th um, eclipse, which I know that you've really been looking into that a little closer. Did you have anything uh, thing else on that? No, just observing what's going on around the world right now. I mean, we've got just over about two months until that eclipse and you can see that so you have inflation well on the rise you have access to food on the decline or on the right access to food is getting harder uh, you see the immigration you see the uh, contention in the united states and all around the world i mean mm -hmm. the same the things that we're seeing here are, are common all around the world shops are being shut down stores are continuing to go out of business People are having a harder and harder time paying their bills. Like you said previously, they're running out of their, their savings. So it's like you can see this coming to a head. Hmm. So it looks like something is going to happen in April. Yeah. Well, yeah. we will see. I'm going to get into the topic, but you might want to check your Wi-Fi network. You're, you were breaking up somewhat pretty bad mm -hmm. while you were talking. I know you got several okay. options there. All right. So... To understand the story, we again, we have to kind of go back to the beginning. And I'm not going to go into the details about their children and what and you know the process of their children, because we talked about Sarah and Abraham. Yeah, on one of these episodes, I'll do something if it interests you guys that has a, a beginning all the way to the end with Abraham, just because he's a, a really important character in the Bible. But in a nutshell... Abraham's origins, he comes from a pagan family. I'm not sure if you guys knew that. And I really didn't know this until I started to, to look into this. His ancestors are the lineage of Noah's son, Shem. But Shem and from the Canaanites, they worshipped many other gods. Because this time period, right about when Abraham was born, was right about th around the time of the collapse of the Tower of Babel. And if you, we haven't done an episode on that, and I will in the future, but there was a reason why God struck that tower down. And it was for several reasons. But one of the founding reasons is that they were, they were worshiping gods they created that really outlined their needs and what they thought, thought was important. So, in Genesis 12 is where we're at. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Just to give you guys a reference point. So, God called to Abraham. God instructs Abraham to leave his country, his family, his people, leave his father, leave their household for a land that God would show him. And the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your family, and your household, and I will show you this land. And a great nation will come from you and your family, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be blessed. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. So, you know, digging into this, I did not realize how significant Abraham was and really the foundation of just about everything in mm -hmm. religion and modern society. I, I knew that he was important, but I didn't really understand it as much as I do now while I was researching this topic. Oh yeah. I'm reminded of Jesus when he's talking to, you know, the different Pharisees and, 
and people who were around during his time when he said, you know, if you were of your father, Abraham, you would, you know, you would have accepted me. You would believe in me. You would rejoice to, for this day that you see. So, you know, the Abraham is the genesis of, you know, when, when, uh, when we're thinking about where we come from, as far as those who are of Abraham. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, I, and I guess I should have known this because, you know, the religions are of the Abraham religions, but it, mm -hmm. it really came together when I was researching him and his origin. So his journey, his separation from his pagan family and his establishment of the founder of a new faith that worshipped only one God, it's a symbol to break away from the past and of a new beginning, a new relationship of, for humanity that was divine. Because prior to him, pretty much everybody was pagans. For some yeah. reason, after Noah, his children went totally pagan, which I, I found interesting, except for one. So the narrative really underscores the theme of faith and obedience, obedience and the transformation as Abraham responds to God's calling by leaving his former life and embracing a, a covenant with God. So we're going to skip yeah. ahead several years because we already kind of, the other night we told the story of his children and how that happened. Mm -hmm. So we're going to skip to when Isaac. So to get to that part, and it's, often referred to as the binding of Isaac. And we're in Genesis 22 now, guys, if you want to turn your page and your Bible. We're in Genesis 22. God tests Abraham's faith by instructing him to take his only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him, who he loves dearly. And he waited many years for Isaac. Abraham prepares to obey God without hesitation, taking Isaac up to the mountaintop and binding him to an altar. And just as Abraham raises his knife to kill his son, an angel calls out to him, telling him to stop. The angel says, now that I know you fear God, and since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me, I will bless you. And he presented Abraham with a lamb as a substitute for the sacrifice. But the story is profound, as Abraham was literally prepared to kill his only son because God had told him to do that. And uh, again, this was something that I didn't truly understand before when I was researching Abraham. Uh, I didn't know that he um, was instructed by God to, to essentially sacrifice his son. Yeah, you have to be careful with the the wording on those things because remember these are translations of translations, mm -hmm. and there there's idioms and figures of speech that are involved that are well worth studying in this regards. You have to compare. You have to keep in mind, like James, for instance, where it talks about. Um, let me just go there. Actually, it's in James one about twelve. So, what do you 13. think is? Um inaccurate with what i just said just curious god doesn't tempt anyone and i'll show you i'll show you uh, so and, and this and it's not you it's just this is a common thing where people will say that god is tempting or testing people hmm. uh but we know from james that he doesn't do that so let me read this blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved he will receive the crown of life the lord has promised to those who love him let no one say when he is tempted i am tempted by god for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Hmm. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So what likely happened is uh, he, uh, Abraham was drawn away by his own desires and enticed whether he got the instruction that he was given wrong. So this is something that would warrant further research and understanding mm -hmm. and order because it has to fit. You can't have a contradiction here to where, because it does seem like God is testing him, right? Well, like no, God no, no. You, you actually make a good point. I wonder if that was Satan's attempt yet again. Yep. You know what and I that's mean? That's my point. Yeah. That's yeah. a great point. It, yet again, 
because there's so many attempts, just like when Sarah got impatient of not having a child through natural childbirth. It, it's my translation that Satan, because she put him up to getting together with their handmaiden and having Ishmael. It's oh, that's yeah. a really good point you make. Hmm. You know, and what what likely happened is is God or an angel was communicating to him that you know something along the lines of uh, the seed that would bruise the head of the serpents, and because God was well aware that He was going to um, send His only begotten do- Son to die for us, so it's entirely possible that Abraham misunderstood that and took it for instructions to to kill his own son, and you can see that the angel interceded to stop him. Hmm. So, but. Uh, it's it definitely I, th- I, I don't know for sure but one thing that we have to be very careful of is 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 when we're looking at this that god does not tempt people because he can't be tempted nor does he tempt anyone else so you have to filter you know these when we're reading these records we have to filter through the through that understanding and it, a lot of times it highlights when satan is involved what about testing What's the difference between testing and tempting? Well, I mean, if you read the book of Job, it's pretty clear that he tested Job. Yeah, I, so I know he chastens us like a father chastens a child saying, don't do this. I think a lot of the times it's like, you know, don't touch the stove. They touch the stove. Oh, it's hot. I told you not to touch the stove. Oh, well, uh, he gave uh, Satan permission to test him. He gave Satan permission to do everything except kill him. And testing yeah, and I think his that, faith I think and actually, loyalty. Yeah, I think you're actually making our point for us because it's Satan who does the tempting, not God. Hmm. So God is a God of justice and, and rules and laws, and a lot of people forget that. So, you know, he has to allow, he, there's, I think it's in Isaiah where he talks about he, he makes the good and creates the evil. Uh, so he's, the creator is responsible for both good and evil. He is a God of mercy and good, and that's how the universe is geared is towards the good but there has to in order for there to be good there has to be evil also so just because he made it available doesn't mean he's the one who's actually doing it that's where satan no, comes involved satan right. is the one who's actually doing the evil so it's not god that's doing and this is also you'll see this as an idiom a lot of times in the old testament where people will, will attribute evil to god but there's an understanding that it's not god actually doing the thing it's just that all things come from god so, but you have to understand that he's not the one who's doing the tempting. It's actually, you know, Satan, the devil, or people who are working for the devil, who are, who are, you know, hmm. uh, giving birth to sin. And that's where the James one fifteen, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. Yeah. That's really interesting. If yeah. uh, now that I think about it, he, he could have been easily deceived just like mm-hmm. that one guest that we had on our show that, you know, with our theory on what happened to him, because, you know, Satan can appear as an angel of light. Hmm. That's right. It really, it really makes you yeah. scratch your head because the story cannot contradict scripture. Right. And it's, it's pretty clear in James. So that's something to really think about. We'll probably have to dig in further to that. All right. So let's, let's see where I was at. All right, so essentially we summarized what happened on top of the mountain, whether it was Satan that tested or tempted him. Clearly an angel got it, you know, stopped it from happening because that would have been catastrophic to the faith. So it, that, that's interesting. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah. So we're going to be in Genesis 18, 19. If you guys want to turn to the Bible, Genesis 18, 19, this contrasts sharply with the story of Abraham and and Isaac, because we're highlighting divine judgment against sin. And to kind of start off with this, it, it shows that God can actually change his mind at times because Abraham negotiated with God to try and spare people from in the city. It, you know, I believe if I'm not mistaken, it started out, God said, if you can find 50 righteous people, I will spare the city. And I believe they went mm-hmm. back and forth several times, uh, getting down to the point where God says, okay, if you can find just 10 people, I will spare the city. So mm-hmm. demonstrating Abraham's compassion and the concept of him just trying to 
to help folks in that city because he had family in the city. His uh, nephew, Lot, was in the city. So the angels visited Sodom. There, there was two angels that arrived in Sodom in that evening before the, the divine judgment and visited Lot. So they were sitting at the city gates and Lot invited them into his home for hospitality. And mm -hmm. this city was known for its extreme wickedness. There was, there was a lot going on. And some even speculate that there was Nephilim in this city. Hmm. Just because th there was just so much evil going on that yeah. it was really out of hand. Matter of fact, when the two guests came to Lot's house... Most of the men in the city surrounded the house, demanding Lot to turn them over so they could have sex with him. Yeah. They, they were beating on the door, demanding Lot to turn over these two guests. And it got to a point where Lot offered his virgin daughters instead, attempting to protect these guests just through hospitality. So it's, for me, it's deeply troubling because you have a, you know, a complex moral aspect in play here. And mm. essentially the angels intervene, blinding the men of Sodom to protect Lot and his family. I just, go you ahead. Want, you want to know why, you want to know why he offered his daughters? Listening. Are you there? Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I got my sound fixed or not. No, you're good. So to to this very day, there's something called the Salt Covenant, and this is something uh, for every, that everybody should look up and understand. Uh, Jesus uses the Salt Covenant in his in his sermons when he's when he's teaching. You know, if the salt has lost its savor, uh, but this is this is still a thing even to this very day that when you eat salted food with somebody or invite them into your home under the shadow of your your protection. It means that you are making a covenant with that person that um, you won't break on the pain of death. When those hmm. angels came into his home and he brought them under the protection of his home and they very likely ate a salted meal together, that mm -hmm. was him making a covenant with them and that he would not break it on pain of death. And they in the East today, this is still a thing. They take that covenant so seriously that he would he would rather offer his daughters rather than breaking that covenant of not protecting those men. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's yep. That's that's just fantastic. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That that's something I didn't know. Mm -hmm. So Next part we're at is, is more the warning from these angels. And we're in Genesis 19, 12 through 22. So the angels revealed their mission to destroy the city and urged Lot to flee with his family. So Lot tried to warn a lot of people. He tried to warn his sons-in-laws that you have to go. And the, the sons-in-laws really responded to him like, hey, you know, you're crazy. You know, we're not leaving. This is where our friends are, you know, that type of thing. But the angels mm -hmm. literally had to drag Lot out of the city with his wife and two daughters. And what they were told to head to the mountains and to not look back. So Lot and his family reach a small town called Zoar, and the Lord rains down sulfur and fire on the cities, utterly destroying them, completely wiping them out. And his wife disobeying the angel's orders, look back. And it said mm -hmm. that she turned into a pillar of salt. But it makes me wonder, what what else could that have been? Because that's a translation. I wonder if it was, what do you think? When many years ago, uh, I was told that, that that was an idiom, meaning that she had a stroke. I'm not so sure if I believe that now. I've tried confirming that myself. And if anyone has any information on the idioms or the Orientalism, I was told it was similar to our kick the bucket. Like she turned back and kicked the bucket. And it was a, a result of breaking the salt covenant uh, from eating the, the salted meal with the angels to where she probably turned back and went back towards the city. And as a result, she was she ended up dying. I know that there's 
a, a lot of people who try to take that literally, and there's even they even have mounds of salt that they they claim are Lot's wife. I don't know if I believe that. Uh, it would be interesting to to confirm number one if the Orientalism or the idiom is actually a thing, and uh, if they've done any testing on those mounds. Well, you know what I mean, because I mean, to me, it would make sense to where if if God's going to nuke a town and somebody heads back towards that town, they're they're taking their life into their own hands. You know what I mean? Well, here's here's something that I find interesting is in in that time period, this area was it was lush with greenery and crops and animals thrived. There was desert in some areas, but this was on the edge of several different waterfronts and mm -hmm. it was at uh, the Dead Sea, but the Dead Sea was not overly saturated with salt yet. So my point is, whatever happened, I wonder if a byproduct was an extreme amount of salt because the mm. Dead Sea became so filled with the byproduct of whatever happened that life was no longer supported. Matter of fact, the mm. salinity level in the Dead Sea is, it's massive. Uh, I watched an episode where the buoyancy of a submarine, they had to add an extra 1,500 pounds in weight to get it to sink. There, hmm. it's, it's actually incredible. When the submarine went under the water, it was just nothing but salt. The salinity level, I, I forget what the, the actual uh, amount was, but it was an enormously high salinity level, much higher than you know, like the oceans. The yeah. water was at such a, you know, had so many minerals and the salt level was so high that nothing could sustain life in it. So I wonder right. if whatever happened and her turning to a pillar of salt and the byproduct of whatever that destruction was also affected because it wasn't called the Dead Sea in that time. It was called something else. Right. I don't have to look it up. But I wonder if that was a byproduct of whatever came down or came up. Because there's That is probably the best explanation I've ever heard of that. It, because it makes sense. It makes total sense. Now, we do know that, uh, they, that Lot had the opportunity to go talk to his sons-in-law, right? So he had he still had family in Sodom and Gomorrah because he had he had asked the angels, can I go, you know, save my, my children? And they just laughed at him. You know, imagine if, you know, you know, grandpa's coming and saying, hey, the city's going to be destroyed. You need to get out. So it's entirely possible that Lot's wife wanted to go back and try and save them. And as a result of that, whatever rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah, fire and brimstone, the side effect could very well have been salt. And that could have been, that is probably the best explanation of her turning into a pillar of salt I've ever heard that actually makes, you know, logistical sense. If there wasn't some kind of molten salt or some byproduct as a result of the destruction of that city that actually got her and everyone else. So that would stand a reason that everybody turned into a pillar of salt. Yeah. So I was investigating the Dead Sea today and there's so much salt that on the shores and anything that's in the water, I, I watched in the hull of a boat that had been sitting in the water for only two days had like six inches of salt built up on it. Like we used to have a, a boat that was in the Atlantic ocean. And usually about once a year, I'd have to clean the hull because of a thin layer of salt built up. But that would be after mm -hmm. a year, just after a few days, this had several inches of salt. And when the submarine went down onto the and look, they were looking for signs of uh, a fallen city. The entire bottom of the Dead Sea, it was flat and the it was nothing but salt. And everything wow. surrounding the Dead Sea is salt. You know, the rocks on the shore, everything. I mean, thick, thick layers of salt. So it mm -hmm. really makes you wonder. What happened when that catastrophe happened? Because that area used to have, it was teeming with life. There was plants and crops and animals everywhere because that's why they had built those towns around that body of water. And there was fresh water nearby and whatnot. And for a long time, it, it was just completely uninhabitable. 
which kind of brings me to my my next point is that I did some detailed research into the Dead Sea and there is actual fresh water spilling into it now because one of the prophecies from the Bible and Zechariah and Ezekiel, let me find it here, is that when the Dead Sea has life coming back to it, it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And you can find that in Ezekiel 47, 8 through 9. So the concept primarily draws from the prophecies that it has been foretold that fresh water will then flow into the Dead Sea, transforming this brackish water. And now scientists have found that there is fish and supported life growing in, in the water again. So it's... <laughs> It's it's fascinating. So what happens is there was sinkholes from whatever happened in that time period, 2,000 years before Christ, and these sinkholes are now filling with fresh water. So it's supporting fish and vegetation growing again. So the scientists are, are really speculating from this phenomena that they're just amazed at their findings because they are finding life again in the Dead Sea, which is a, a prophecy from Zechariah and Ezekiel. I'm sitting here reading about salt, seeing if it's flammable or dangerous. And one of the th one of the characteristics about it is it's is it's doesn't burn. It only melts and it doesn't combust. It just melts. So I'm wondering if there wasn't some kind of like volcanic eruption that hmm. would have melted the salt that maybe she would have gotten covered with or sucked into. Hmm. hmm. That's it. That's interesting. Is there any correlation with the Dead Sea and Sodom and Gomorrah in your research? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah, that was the, whatever the sea was called, it was called something else, but that's the area that hmm. Sodom and Gomorrah was. It was, there were th those towns were near these bodies of water. And the reason there was a submarine at that time going into the Dead Sea, looking at the bottom of the Dead Sea, is they thought at one point that Sodom and Gomorrah were at the bottom of there because it's a completely flat sea. And I'm not sure mm. if you guys are aware of this, but the Dead Sea and the grounds around that area, it's the lowest point on Earth. It sits... Mm. Uh, extremely, I think, uh, several hundred meters below the sea level. It's actually the lowest place on Earth. And someone in the chat can probably tell me how much further down it is, but it is literally the lowest place on Earth. So wow. from, from what I found is it, there was five towns. They spared one of them. Uh, there was more than just Sodom and Gomorrah. There was four kings that had completely right. went rebellious and stuff of that nature, but they were all circulated right there on the edge of Jordan and Israel uh, near that body of water that, again, was not called the Dead Sea, but it's referenced in the Bible several times. But it is the Dead Sea based off of the maps and several things. And they've, wow. in recent years... And I, I think I shared this uh, through a text message. They're finding evidence in that area from what looks like a, a very destructive event. They're finding mm -hmm. skeletons and pottery that date back to that time period, 2,000 years before Christ. And these skeletons and the pottery have a glaze of tantonite on it that can mm -hmm. only happen when an extreme heat of like 4,000 plus degrees happen or a nuclear wow. blast. And they're wow. finding engraved into the sand sediments and the sides of the hill, they find, um, what was it that rained out of the sky? What was it called? Uh, fire and brimstone. Yeah. So they were finding brimstone in the actual settlement. There's another name for brimstone. I forget what it's called, but the scientific term for it, but they found tons and tons of sulfur. evidence. Yes. There you go. Sulfur rocks. They were finding massive deposits of sulfur rocks, sulfur rocks, three or four inches in diameter, millions of them in that area. And the skeletons and the pottery all having a glaze. Here's the best part. All having a glaze on only one side. 
so facing the side of the blast. So I found that interesting. And to address someone's comment that said Shem did not um, worship multiple gods, it was just Shem's, it came from that ancestry line. I think um, Abraham's bloodline was eight or nine generations from Shem, meaning Shem was his great, 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 great grandfather. So somewhere along the lines in that ancestry, in their bloodline, they were all worshiping uh, yeah, idols and false gods. They were making their own gods. So it, that wasn't a direct reference to Shem, but it was that bloodline that totally essentially went sideways and was a part of the Tower of Babel. And one of the reasons why um, they were completely pagan. You know, it was hmm. it's very interesting because it appears that the lifestyle of what had happened before the days of Noah was happening again. Because Sodom and Gomorrah were not the only times that God destroyed an entire town. Right. There were several cases after that where the Israelites, when they were looking for the promised land, would wipe out complete towns, men, women, and children. And we've discussed this before. It was in the event to prevent the seed line corruption. So for me, I found that fascinating. Yeah, that's immensely fascinating. There's a lot of talk of lithium in in the uh, chat about lithium being a type of salt. Which hmm. if there's a combination of like sulfur and lithium, that would be really interesting. I'm just, hmm. I, I, I don't know why. So... Where did they find? I know you've been sharing these text messages recently about where they're where they're finding these these bodies. How far away from the Dead Sea are they? Do you know? Uh, it was right. It was uh, in close proximity. The towns that they've uh, they've pretty much identified, and I should have put this up on a map because it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. the The one gentleman that was investigating it was using satellites and in, in outer space to identify abnormalities on the ground and in the body of water, they could pinpoint mm. the massive craters and sulfur deposits, and which led mm. them to a very specific area off the, the body, off the Dead Sea that was in the Jordan Valley near Israel. And they are 100% positive now. They have identified the towns. Just wow. because they've, they've dated the bones, they've dated the pottery... And then on top of that, the, the pottery and the bones have that tanzanite glaze from an extremely high heat event. And then in the sand and rock settlements, you have all the sulfur balls, like mm -hmm. big, big stones. And in Israel, they have museums now where they have these big sulfur balls that are dated to that time that is literally the wow. fire and brimstone. So what do you I, think? Do you think there was some kind of technology used? Do you think the angels set off a, a nuclear bomb or some kind of nuclear weapon? Or do you think this was a, a wrath of God type of thing where, you know, there was a volcanic eruption that just took out the towns? Well, according to the research that I was studying, which was another fascinating point, the bodies and the clay had a glaze on a very specific angle where the fire and brimstone came down from a 45 degree angle. Really? So it did not come up. It, so it, it came. It, so it came out it, of the it, sky. It came out of the sky like a, like a huh. skyburst nuclear blast. It came from a forty-five degree angle, which wow. I found fascinating. They had skeletons that they found behind structures, like rock wall structures, where the bottom half of the skeleton was all intact, and the top half that was exposed over the rock wall were completely gone. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and, don't mess with the creator. Man, when he says don't do something, don't do something. <laughs> yeah, and I shared a picture with you, and I should have put it in my screen share preparation. They've And I've, I've shared this on our Facebook page, but they found the, the, the oldest homosexual couple ever found right. that was dated to that time period. There was a skeleton. They were bound together, uh, covered in the tanzanite glaze. So wow. it's this is something that's really fascinated me because for years and years they speculated that this was just a story to scare people but now they have mm -hmm. they have hard evidence 
They have it's amazing hard, how many records in the Bible that they're starting to find hard evidence for. Yeah, you know, people like, always think that they're it's that they're made up stories that they're retelling of of mythology, and you know other other story records from other cultures. This stuff happened so long ago. It doesn't surprise me that the record of this information hasn't been told and retold in every single civilization on this planet. And just like the game of telephone, you know, the names and descriptions can change, but the content still remains the same. This is why I look to, uh, you know, often look at any information that uh, supports or refutes these things because, you know, one culture may be just using a different name, but telling you the same story, like, you know, a great flood. So... Yeah, there's. Um, this is why I don't it, dismiss. This is. It's like you know the the whole process of studying is, you know, you have to be willing to consider, you know, things that you agree with and things you don't agree with. Otherwise, you're only you're 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 biasing yourself to something that you think you know, and you're not really comparing with all the evidence and all the information that's out there. Uh, you know, my biggest recommendation for people is you know, get work on getting rid of ego and pride and thinking that, you know, it all and take the mentality of, uh, of being okay with being wrong. I think, I think naturally people are afraid of being wrong. Everybody just wants to be right. They want to do the right thing. They want to, you know, know the difference between good and evil. They want by and large, they want to know uh, what's right. And, and there's, I, I know I struggled with this growing up is you, there's a fear of failure. There's a fear of being wrong and that can, that can really limit you in your growth. It really boils down to if you focus on loving God and loving your neighbor and all things, like even if you're in an argument over something about who's right about a certain situation, just make sure you're doing it in love and not as a, as a means to prove yourself or prove that you're right. You know, be willing to listen to the other person, make sure you're understanding what they're saying, you know, and you may learn something and more often than not, you will learn something, you know, ego or what does the scripture say? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a great fall. Hmm. So anyway, sorry, rabbit hole there. <laughs> no, but you're absolutely right. It's important to remain humble because yeah. God will humble you if you don't. Mm-hmm. That's right. He, he will. He will. Careful if you ask for wisdom. <laughs> God will humble those who do not remain humble. Uh, I've yeah. seen it happen. It's happened to me. And it's, it's, it's why I try to remain open-minded and I stay humble and stay loving. Because yeah. God will humble you. That's, it's, 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 that's a fact. Yeah. So let's see here. So when I, I'll recut this episode and and release it into our video gallery later this week. And I'm going to overlay a lot of my findings, um, from, from my research. So it will be really interesting to see how this goes. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions? I'm not going to go too much of in a rabbit hole on this though. I could say and mention the aftermath of, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's in Genesis 19, 30 through 38. So Lot and his daughters, after they lost their wife, they went to a cave and were pretty much living in a cave outside of Zoar. And they mm-hmm. were pretty much facing isolations. And his daughters, they they were really worried about having offspring because uh, their husbands died in the town and there was no men for them to know. So essentially Lot got drunk from the way I understand it, or the daughters got him drunk and they yeah. essentially raped their father and yep. had babies mm-hmm. and their childbirth produced Moab and, and Ben Abi. Yeah. The Mobanites yep. and the, the Ammonites. 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 Yep. So it's an interesting complex relationship because Moab came from his daughter's essentially incest. So it's, yeah, just wanted to add that on to the end of that story. So it's a detailed timeline of the gravity of sin and the severity of the d- divine judgment. Yeah. And I think it really ties into what's going on today because this was in the time period of the days of Noah. And, 
we are living in the days of Noah. And just like God said, his wrath would never be a flood again, but it would be a fire. Fire and brimstone, just like it happened in Sodom and Gomorrah. So I think the story really correlates and should be Mm. a stark reminder of his wrath. Folks that are in denial, man, it's, you may not be a believer now, but I promise you, you will be. Yes. I promise. All too soon. Probably within the next three years. Yeah. It's, I hope that we have a grand revival and we have more time to bring more to Christ, but I try to remain hopeful and positive, but the reality of it is you can see what's going on in the world. Yeah. It, it's, there's a lot of people that are blinded by the God of this world saying that times have never been better, the science, and it's, it's just something else. It's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around. And maybe because the believers in Christ actually see the truth, and so many are blinded by the reality because it clearly talks about the God blinding the, the folks that don't have their feet firmly planted with him. Yeah. I go back and forth with that Stephen guy still every, you see my text from him earlier. I did. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, you know, and he has his own religion. People, people like to claim that they don't believe in God, but you listen to him fight and argue about what they do believe in, you know, whether it's evolution or what, you know, what it, whatever it is, everybody believes something. And the question is, is, uh, you know, what, <laughs> Like with him, he doesn't. He 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 thinks there's nothing. And we've talked to a couple of people. What was uh the what was that other gentleman we had on the show? Uh, um, you know, there's there's nothing after after light. It's Roland. just you, Roland. Yeah, you just go into go into nothingness, which it's interesting because they believe you come from nothing, and then you go into nothing, and hmm. you know that just that doesn't make sense. You know, when you look at the course of history and the course of the world, there's there's a natural order to things. Yeah. You know, without going, without getting into like the religion of evolution and stuff like that, that would be an interesting show to go in and, and talk about evolution, how it is actually a religion and, and a belief. And it's, it's something that is, it's been made so common that I do believe that there's evolution be- within a species. I see that as a farmer when we're, mm-hmm. when we're breeding different animals together, you get different colors and different attributes that you sure. can breed towards. Yeah. So there's definitely evolution within a species, but not from one species to another. Like I can't breed a duck and a chicken together. They just, it just doesn't work. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and the crazy animals, they, they, they do actually try, <laughs> you know, it's just like they're, they're dumb animals and they do, they do try those things, but we never get, you know, a turducken uh, or, hey, or, I, or any other crossbreeds. Go ahead. Um, one of our viewers, I, I remember her either emailing me or commenting in one of the shows. And I told her to ask during the live stream, but she asked, um, do you know anything about the mark of Cain? I, I don't. And I, oh, wonder- you know, that was a, that was a good thing that I considered bringing up. I, I, I wish we would have talked about more when we were talking about the Nephilim and the fallen angels, because I'm of the opinion, and this is just a guess that Cain was likely Nephilim that who was it that came down? It wasn't some Jaza. It was, um, Gadriel. Who, yeah. who deceived Eve, according to the book of Enoch. Uh, right. I'm of the opinion that Cain was the offspring of Eve and Gadriel. Yeah. And whatever, the, I, I believe that whatever he was marked with was the result of that union. And it was starkly different from Adam and Eve's children. So I, I, I'm of the opinion, and this is just purely a guess, just trying yeah. to, you know, figure things out and see if it fits, you know, refute the argument. If you have evidence, um, support the argument. If you have evidence right now, it's just a guess, but I'm of the opinion that, that Cain was very likely Nephilim considering he was a murderer from the very beginning. He rose up and killed his brother Abel. And when, and the reason why I think that is because when Adam or when Eve when God talked to Adam and Eve and declared the curse on them immediately after that. Um, so I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but Eve wasn't named Eve until after 
they had fallen, after they had sinned. It was after God declared the curse on them that she was called Eve, and it says because she was the mother of all living. In other words, they had had children prior to the fall, which is why that's kind of my supporting evidence to where it's entirely likely that Cain was was Nephilim, probably the first Nephilim. Yeah. And his mark, who knows? I mean, look at the different races we have today. We have multiple races. I almost wonder if we all don't have a little bit of Nephilim blood in us, and that's not the reason we're all dead in trespasses and sins, is because whatever, I don't know if it's possible to keep a, a purely clean, pure bloodline uh, of Adam and Eve all the way to now when there's been trillions and trillions of people on the planet with the intermixing. It wouldn't surprise me if that's not where the different races come from. You know, if if one of the if all the variation of the races isn't because the genetics just kind of got mingled up with the fallen angels. So the mark yeah. of Cain, I think, is 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 just a, a result of that union. And I'm reluctant to like point at any one race because it could be us. You know what? We the the mark of the beast could be what I look like. It could be what you look like. It could be what anybody looks like. So I don't want to point fingers at any any individual race or person because that's when you start getting hatred and we're told to love our neighbors. So absolutely. So uh, hopefully Jesus is love. I answered your question because she asked me several times about the mark of Cain. So hopefully that answered that. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? We're going to any other questions. We're going to take a second just to answer questions before I move on to something else. But just wanted to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, everybody's Jesus. quoting Genesis 4, 1 and Adam knew his wife, knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Uh, mm. That would warrant some that would warrant some looking into. That's a good point. I think that's probably supporting evidence that Cain was the offspring of Adam and Eve, but it'd be worth looking into because I, we do Eve. because it's not specifically addressed in Genesis when Eve was deceived by Gadriel. That's that's covered in the book of Enoch. So. You'd also have to, you want to read that and it's a native language as well. You, I'd like to see what it says yeah. in Hebrew to see yeah. exactly how it's worded. Um, yeah. Because it, as Watchful's said many times, this is a translation of a translation. And not to say that some, you're... Yeah, and there's, and there's summaries in there. If you look at Genesis 1, it's a, it's a summary. And Genesis 2 and 3 are giving you know light into the, the, the various days. And... It's there's a lot of information that's left out and there's a lot of information that's generalized. So there are uh, there are occasions to where Adam could just be referring to something ambiguous rather than an individual human being. So there's a lot to consider in that regards. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I see someone asking about flat earth again. <laughs> no, oh, I'd love to talk it. about that, but I don't. All that does is create division, we, guys. You know, maybe you, here's the thing. Maybe we'll do that behind in the in the members show for the because we're working towards doing like a membership and we want to have something that is entertaining that that people would be willing to pay for that we can provide some value. Maybe we can do some highly intensive uh, discussions around stuff like that to where we can really get into it because Christopher is very passionate about this. He has he has a lot of evidence in regards to flat Earth. Uh, but this that's not for YouTube. That's, we're not going to do that here. Yeah, and uh, just to plant the seed, I I don't support the flat earth theory um, just because of things I know and I've seen with my own eyes and evidence that I have and family members that I'll have to get into this another time. But uh, I don't want to create division in our family here because folks can not really get bent out of shape about the flat earth thing. It's one of those yeah. things where they will, you know, I've seen people get butt hurt and go home. Yeah. So it's not worth it to me to make my point just to drive a wedge in our family. So this is the reason I, I dance around this topic. It's not something I'm yeah. interested in talking about and creating division. Yeah. If you really want to hear about it, we'll talk about it, but it, not on YouTube. There's a lot of good information. We have a lot of good topics that we're going to talk about off this platform that you guys are going to find fascinating. The research that I've done that will 
really, really interest you guys, especially when it comes to missing children and stuff of that nature. But again, that's for something else off this platform. Let's see. Somebody here. asked a question. If is the uh, 24, have I considered if the 24 elders means 24 eclipses in the end times? I haven't. That'd be worth counting. I know there's been a lot of, there's been well more, way more than 24 eclipses since the one in 2017. The, the one in 2017 is the anchor point. I'd start from that point. It'd be interesting to count them. Actually, I could probably do it here live on the show. Count. I don't yeah. know if I have every single one. I think it's timeanddate.com is where, where they list all those things. Can you pull it up? Yeah. I'm going to. Can you put it on your screen share? Yeah, give me a minute. Yeah, this is something that um, we've had many people ask about. Many, many people ask about um, the eclipses and the 24 elders. But like someone else said in the comments, the topic of the flat earth or the round earth is not a salvation issue. It's not something that's going to determine your salvation. Just like if you believe there is a pre-tribulation rapture or a post-tribulation rapture, this is not a salvation issue. It's an interesting topic to discuss, but like I've said already, there's certain topics that create division. People get really, really animated about what they believe when it comes to some of this stuff. And that's just, I think that's probably the only topic I don't really get into just because people get very defensive over it. So, but we'll talk about it at some point, uh, but not tonight, just because I would like to have my ducks in a row to present the evidence that I have. And I have a lot of it. And I think once you guys hear what I have to say, you'll be like, oh, <laughs> you mean to yeah. switch to your screen? I'm trying to find the list of all the eclipses. See, oh, here it is. List of all eclipses from 1990 to, yeah, you can switch to me now. I don't see a screen so, option. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Hang on, let me share my screen. <clears throat> yeah, while you're sharing it. your screen, I'm going to check on my daughter who was, uh, I think I heard them fighting with the cats. So, okay, so bear, fun. Yeah, bear with me. Um, let's see here. I'm going to add your, you are set to go. All right. So we're going to go from 2010 to 2019. And so there's nothing. So those are solar. So I'm at timeanddate.com slash eclipse slash list.html if anyone wants to go look at this site. They do a good job of listing all the eclipses, partial, salt total, stuff like that. There's way more than 24. I mean, there's like four per year, and it's already been seven years. That's like 28 eclipses. Um, yeah, see, this one's got one, two, three, four, five. So if you just did maybe total or like blood moons and eclipses. So you would start from, so the August 21st one is the one a month before the September 23rd uh, revelation 12 sign. This one seemed really significant. This is, this is one of the ones that uh, plays part of the X across the United States. So you could do one, two, three, four, five, six. Oops. Go back. Where did I do? I clicked. Um, probably wouldn't count that one. I would count it after the Revelation 12 sign because that one's actually. So this is well, this one was significant. This was a this was getting our attention, I think, for well, we'll count it. We'll see how close we get. We'll count solar and lunar and see what we come up with. One, two, three. I don't think we should count partial eclipses. It's usually the full ones that I count. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's up to 2019. And we want to do the next 10 years. Mm, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, mm, 17, 18, uh, so I want a full one, partial 18, 
19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. That actually puts us in the ballpark of 2027. So, um, we're so if the 1,260 days starts in April, we're speculating that it starts April 28th. But it could be because we don't know when the true start of the Festival of Trumpets is. Uh, April 28th is just the current calendar. So if you go, you can go look at Hebrew calendars today. Uh, they're planning on doing the fr- uh, Festival of First Fruits on April April 28th. So if you go from April 28th to the Day of Atonement in 2027, you're going until October. So there's no solar eclipse on either of those days. The eclipse is actually this one right here. This is the one that we're paying attention to. This is the one that's coming up because it is... This is... This is the one that is um, in the constellation. So the constellation is what's really got our attention on this one. So if we come into here. That's interesting. Yeah, here, I'm going to show this constellation. So this is from our slideshow when Kip was here. I put it on the end of that slideshow right here. So this is what that eclipse looks like. This is why we're looking to this one. So that eclipse is in Pisces and it's on the chain that's restraining it. So the chain is made up of these stars right here that that form this line that go into the fish. So you've got these two fish and then you have the dragon. So this, these, these stars right here, this is a stellarium. I'd turn off the, um, the pictures here so you can actually see the uh, the lines and the alignments but so this is cetus this is a dragon also known as leviathan and then you've got these two fish which are restraining leviathan. and you've got the eclipse that looks like it's cutting that chain that's been restraining it so we liken that to potentially the restrainer being removed that's talked about in thessalonians anyway so that's why april 8th is so significant uh, and and one one that we're really looking for. So it's entirely possible that the uh, the two witnesses, whoever they are, whether they're two individuals or two groups, or a combination of both, two individuals along with two groups of people, the 1,260 days could start here. But I think it makes more sense that it would start at the festival of first fruits, which would be according to the Hebrew calendar that they're tracking now without getting into an argument over how we calculate calendars, because I'm fully aware that calendars are messed up. Um, That's why I just work off these eclipses because eclipses seem to be God's markers for when things are happening. Cause we've seen a history of that. We've seen the pattern of that over the last four, you know, we've, we've got a video um, on the seven seals where we've gone into an exhaustive amount of detail supporting that that you can go if you haven't seen that video go watch that video uh because we we show how revelation 4 is a celestial clock and how the eclipses are actually like our hands that point out when things are happening so this one really good video yeah this one isn't one of the eclipses that's being um, called attention to by the living creatures this one stands alone and it's significant because of what i pointed out here with where it's at But it seems like this is a good candidate for the start of the 1,260 days. And uh, I'm I'm not expecting, I don't know what I'm expecting on this day. There may be nothing that actually happens on this day, but within the month of April, very likely on April 28th, that's when I'm looking to something happening. And we may know what it means uh, you know, when it says that the two witnesses receive power and authority to stop the rain and bring the plagues and that anybody who would try to harm them must be harmed in the way that they, they try to harm them, kill them in the way that they try to kill them. And I'm really curious to see what it means to breathe fire from their mouth. You know, is this going to be some supernatural capability or, you know, is this going to be somebody here? You know, we've talked about God and the angels having technology. You know, does God literally give these individuals like their own Iron Man suits? I mean, like you could if somebody had seen some kind of a suit, like if John had seen somebody wearing some kind of technology that had 
missiles and, you know, energy weapons that they could, you know, use to destroy people, it would make them virtually unkillable. I mean, we could see something like that. We might start seeing supernatural capabilities or supernatural or technology that we've just been completely blinded to come into fruition on this, on this day. Anyway, way down a deep rabbit hole. So yeah, yeah, the 1,260 days, I think starts sometime in April and it's going to go until 2027, probably to, uh, October. So there's another Hmm. eclipse here. Uh, so it's interesting. So this came about from counting the eclipses. We got into the ballpark by counting the eclipses. It's entirely possible that the 24 hours could be referring to eclipses. I don't know which ones you would pick though, because I, I had to pick, I had to count both solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. I don't think I would make it to the 2027 if I counted just one or the other. Hmm. So it, it, it was, but still you could make a good argument. Yeah, it would be interesting to, uh, we should count if there's 12 total solar eclipses and 12 lunar eclipses uh, between that point in time, which there's not going to be from April. There's just not enough time from April 2024. So you got one, two, three, that's not a total, four, five, six. So you only get six, maybe seven from in, in, in a three year period of time. And then I don't think you'll even get that many of the, uh, total lunar eclipses i keep uh, seeing um questions on the three days of darkness <sighs> i feel like we've talked about that before wasn't that didn't we ask ben that if he knew anything about it <clears throat> yeah i think we've talked about that and kip has talked about it as well uh, i don't really have any information on three days of darkness yeah i mean when i think of three days i think the three days of the two witnesses are three and a half days of the two witnesses are dead yeah, but yeah, Ben did bring something up about when the Earth flips that there'll be some kind of sh- something happens to the sun where it goes dark, and it, it gets this kind of it's like the it's what did he call it? Yeah, you get so some kind of a crust. It's like the crust hardens on it. It does, it, and the sun yeah. goes black. Uh, there's a shell that forms around it, and we've yeah. shared this video several times. Uh, it's one of Ben's videos called "A Disaster Is Coming." And it's it, for me, it's extremely fascinating because he's studied the science and it lines up with scripture. It's 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 extremely fascinating. It's yeah. it's definitely worth the watch. If you guys have not seen it, we've linked it many, many times. If you guys want me to link it again, I'd be glad to. Yeah, let's see here. What other questions do we have? Questions, questions. Breathing, Bueller. breathing fire from the mouth is sheer anger in the Holy Spirit. I get that. Um, yeah, we're we're rather we're we're relatively tame in in our discussions here, but we've gotten into some pretty heated uh, disagreements with certain people, uh, and it's a challenge to be you know loving and and meek. But I'm I'm almost wondering if the two witnesses aren't unleashed. You know, when 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 it's at that period of time where you don't have to hold back anymore, that could be what it means when it's talking let about me, fire from their mouth. Let me say something here. Gina, you I've seen you say this comment before. Astrology is paganism. There's a difference between astrology and astronomy. Yeah, uh, there's yeah. a big difference between the two. They're not the same thing, Gina. Yeah, you're probably you're probably referring to uh, like horoscopes where there's uh, the pretended art of trying to interpret a particular meaning from a day or the future. Uh, that's not what we're doing. I know it's tempted to it, it may sound like that because we're talking about constellations, eclipses, uh, zodiac stars and in, in, in certain places. Um, I don't know if my words can convince you without you just taking the time to understand this for yourself, the best way that I can explain this that I think makes the most sense is that as a society, we use the sun, moon, and stars every single day. There's nothing inherently evil about them. God set them for signs, seasons, days, and years. When it says seasons, it means appointed times, Moedim. And those are God's festivals and important dates, like when Jesus was born, when there's certain feasts and festivals that we're supposed to be celebrating things. It stands to reason that it also goes to indicate you know, important times, like when the seals are being opened. So we use these every day. The sun and the moon mark out 24-hour periods of time. Without the sun and moon, you don't know how long it's been 
Uh, there's been people who have been trapped in isolation who very quickly lose track of time because they don't have the sun and the moon. Likewise, when the sun is in a particular constellation, that's how we know what month it is. In a constellation, we're not talking about any mythical association. We're literally just talking about a section of the sky that's marked out with stars. Those stars happen to have a pattern and there's, associ there's long, well-established images that are associated with those groupings of stars that have gone through, that have been traced back thousands of years. Uh, the only ones that are important are the 12 that the sun goes through. Uh, cultures, not a lot of people are aware of this, cultures in history have invested more in studying the stars than they have their own defense. Consider Egypt with the, uh, the Sphinx. Many people think that the Sphinx actually tells you how to understand reading the stars. It has the head of a woman and the body of a lion, which in the, in the constellations that the sun goes through, you, you have Virgo, which is a woman, and you have Leo the lion. That tells you that the sun going through Virgo and ending in the lion is where you start and stop because it's a circle, right? Anyway, we use these every day in our lives in order to understand where we are in time. So when we're looking at these, we're looking at God's time clock. We're not trying to predict the future beyond what's already written in the scripture because there's the, the scripture is telling us prophecy, things that are going to happen in the future. So the Revelation 12 sign, for instance, that is a sign that is so rare it never happens. Let me bring that up for you. Yep, so just to be clear, astrology, astronomy, two totally different things. Yeah. You know, God put the stars, the moon, and the planets, that's his creation. He put them up there for a reason, for us to be able to tell the seasons. And, you know, he just went into all that. But I just want to make sure that, because I've heard this more than once from more than one viewer. And it's important to understand this, as it seems like this is a common misconception. Though, yeah. there's a drastic difference between the two. Did you want me yeah, to switch so you're back aware to your screen? Of, yeah, switch back to my screen. You're aware of the Rev. You're aware of, you are aware of Revelation twelve one and two, and another wonder appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars, and pain to be delivered. That's obviously talking about a sign that's in heaven because it literally says a wonder appeared in heaven. Well, this is what we believe that is referring to. So these are the constellations that I talked about that the sun goes through. Don't get caught up on the pictures. We're not really putting any weight into the pictures other than the fact that this, this section of the sky has been associated with a woman for thousands of years. Uh, uh, archaeologically, uh, I think we have archaeological evidence going back. It's not thousands of years. It was Ptolemy that rediscovered some of the stuff. And I think he, he discovered the original 48 going back into uh, history. Uh, so 48 of them are, are we, can, we can establish that have been known for a very long time. The rest of them, there's another 40 of them that NASA has added just to mark out sections of the sky. They have no biblical significance at all whatsoever. And we don't even know if all 48 have big biblical significance. The ones we, we concern ourselves with the most are just the ones that the sun goes through. This is called the ecliptic, also known as the zodiac. And I know that word probably sounds scary. I believe it just means <laughs> circle of animals. <laughs> it's just a word that just, it either means path of the sun or circle of animals. I can't remember what it is, uh, but it's, it is not evil anyway. Uh, so when you look at the scripture, another wonder appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. So you have Virgo here is one of the constellations, one of the section, a section of the sky that the sun goes through. And this happens every year because the sun goes through 12 constellations every year. So it's not unusual for the sun to go through this. What's unusual, though, is for the sun to be in here, the moon under her feet with Jupiter. Jupiter is in retrograde for nine months, which just happens to be the gestation period for a child. And then above her head, there's there's 12 stars. And that this sign right here never happens. And there's been a lot of people who have validated this. Uh, I personally have gone back 7,000 years and forward 7,000 years. So I can uh, confidently say that I have checked 
14,000 years worth of alignments. And this sign never happens in this way within a 14,000 year period of time. What that tells us is, is that is that this is an anchor point into scripture because the scripture talks about this particular sign and you and I happen to live during the period of time that it happened, which it happened on September 23rd, 2017. So we're not making this stuff up. We're just making the correlations. This is literally a fact of something that happened and anybody who wants to can verify it and validate it. And, you know, if you can believe if you want to, that this is what the scripture was talking about, or you can deny it. That's entirely up to you. We don't stand approved before each other. We stand approved before God. So it's up to each one of us to verify these things, whether we want to believe them or not. So check it out. You know, if, if, if you don't think that this is what it's referring to, that's great. Do your own study. You're the one who stands approved before God. I, I don't stand approved before anybody else, not even Christopher. Although I do like his <laughs> approval every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tomorrow night, we will have some interesting stuff we're going to talk about. Sunday nights are our news night. So we're going to recap pretty much everything mm. that's happened all week. So yeah, it will be a good show. I have nothing else for tonight. I didn't do too much digging because uh, I forced myself to hang out with family and relax. It's, it's a habit that I'm not used to doing. I'm usually used to working every second that I'm awake. But I'm yeah. glad that Watchful is talking me into doing this because we're trying to set the example to... It's, it has nothing to do with your salvation, though it's a good example to set just because it's what God asked for. You know, he tells us to rest on the seventh day. So it's, it's something that I'm trying to form a habit on, and uh, I'm appreciative to him for him staying on top of me on top of that. Yeah. Everybody's so, going to take a break. Even even if the creator takes a break from working, who are we to think that we shouldn't take a break, right? Yeah. Looking at a comment here, a good way to differentiate between the two, astronomy as a branch of science, astrology is not. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. Very well said. Very well said. All right, guys. That's all I got for tonight. We'll see you tomorrow night. Remember... If you have time, sub to our other channel, the Truth Burns channel. We're trying to grow that channel. We're going to start a few other channels as well. We're trying to grow everything. Watchful yeah. has been hard at work building our website, building an app. We have a lot of things in the cooker. So we're really excited. And we're really thankful for everybody that's here with us. We really enjoy seeing the same people every night in the chat. It's a family that we just, we really enjoy being around. And we hope that we're able to help some folks too. Hopefully we have new people in the group that are, they have questions about coming to Christ or getting to know him or what the process is. We would love to be able to help you. It's salvation, it's a free gift. It's available to everybody. It doesn't matter what you've done in the past. It's a, died, a God, Christ died on the cross for everybody. For all mankind. So it's a free gift to everybody. There's no special circumstances. So if you have questions, feel free to comment or email us. Our email is in every description. Do you have anything else, Watchful? Nope. All right, guys. Exciting days ahead. Put the uh, sassy Cindy said, can you put the link in the chat? Which link are you referencing? Probably for the Truth Burns channel. Okay, yeah, if you look in the description of this video, you'll find the link. I even put the link in the description to Elon Mo, uh, Elon's post also um, referencing the carbon tax. So we try to mm -hmm. load up the description with everything that you guys need. Everybody have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow night, 9 o'clock. Shalom, shalom.